Good evening. I'm Raihan Salam, president of the Manhattan Institute. Tonight is my first time meeting many of you since I formally began this job. It is my great pleasure to do so. For those I haven't yet, I'm very much looking forward to it. Endeavors like the Hayek Prize are why I'm so honored to be part of the MI community. Over the past 15 years, the prize has highlighted a remarkable range of issues and thinkers, from Matt Ridley, whose theory of the rational optimist gave us reason to keep faith with the future, to Bill Easterly, whose work changed the way we think about development, and in so doing, did a great service to some of the world's poorest and most vulnerable people. Underlying it all is a clear purpose, to honor the legacy of Friedrich Hayek, among the most important thinkers of the 20th century. His was one of those rare minds that had the capacity to reach people who disagreed with him, to stir them from their complacency, and to show them how exciting it could be to embrace the creativity and dynamism of a free society. But our goal isn't only to look backward. The Hayek Prize is among the most generous book prizes in the world because we want to create a solid foundation for the Hayeks of current and future generations to emerge. We want to ensure that there is always an incentive and a platform for serious scholarly work that highlights the benefits of free markets or the frequent perils of central planning. I believe we need such thinkers now more than ever. That's why we are so grateful for the generosity of Thomas and Diane Smith, who have supported the Hayek Prize since its inception in 2005. I'd also like to thank everyone on our prize committee for their outstanding efforts to select our finalists and winner. This year, as ever, we've had a terrific group of books to consider. Before we begin, we created a short video that highlights the many outstanding finalists our prize committee considered this year. I hope that you enjoy it. Our present political order made it almost inevitable that governments were driven into senseless policies. Hayek spoke of a nation moving gradually towards dictatorship without being aware of it. While socialism could never do what it promised, it was inevitable that it should come because the existing political institutions drove us into it. The theme that the jury selected this year, which is reflected in our finalists, is what are the, the guideposts on the road to serfdom? How do we know when we should stop and turn around? Each book addresses a different obstacle, but it also addresses a different opportunity, a way to step back and turn around and find the better path, the path that is the road to freedom. In a wonderful book, The Tyranny of Metrics, Professor Jerry Muller shows us how metrics corrupt our judgment in the military, in education, in quantifying foreign aid, in the running of cities. The project, whatever it is, becomes about the metrics and not about the original goal. Muller's final argument is that the individual matters. Personal judgment based on experience is better than any metric. Hayek lived to see the humiliation of the theories of the man who was his great rival, John Maynard Keynes. America's failing economy by economic historian Eric Krauss tells us exactly how it happened, how fine-tuning failed over and over again. And he leads all the way up into the Carter era, culminating in a Saturday Night Live skit in which President Carter tries to micromanage the economy and shows how foolish that is. I'm an employee of the U.S. Postal Service in Kansas. Letters keep getting clogged in the first level sorting grid. Is there anything that can be done about this? Well, Mrs. Uh, Horbath, Vice President Mondale and myself were just talking about the Marvex uh, 3000 this morning, as a matter of fact. Um, I do have a suggestion. You know the caliper post on the first grid sliding armature? Yes. Okay, there's a three-digit setting there where the post and the armature meet. Now, when the system was installed, the angle of cross slide was put at a maximum setting. In 2017, Congress enacted 97 laws and federal agencies issued 3,281 rules. Peter Wallison argues that we're losing our democracy by permitting bureaucrats to make rules. 
Interestingly, he's optimistic. The votes of the American people still count, and if they are persuaded that changes in government policies are necessary, those corrections will eventually be made. Order generated without design can far outstrip plans men consciously contrive. That's the insight of Hayek. Alain Berteau applies it to every sphere of urban life. Success is not top-down. He prefers professional competence, indicators, and urban planners who heed that evidence. Here's the problem. These giant tech companies have so much power. My notion is you can be an umpire or you can own a team, but you can't do both at the same time. And that's how we should break up. Amazon, it's how we should break up. Google. Political leaders now are calling for government to break down companies when they appear too big. George Gilder reminds us, as Hayek did, that markets break down companies when they become too big. Gilder argues that any problem we have with the internet will be rectified by future innovation. And a new computing platform known as blockchain is a challenge to Google. 30 years ago, you would have heard him predict the iPhone. You would have heard him predict the breakdown of old-fashioned telephony. What we're talking about is somewhere near a 10,000-fold increase in the cost-effectiveness of computing in the next decade or so. This is the most important thing that's happening in the world today. There's nothing that touches it. So we ignore him at our peril. One of the members of our jury, Tom Easton of The Economist magazine, mentioned that for years he had been looking for a history of trade to use in his work. He found that book in the winner of the Hayek Prize this year, Doug Irwin's Clashing Over Commerce. James Madison predicted that there's going to be domestic political problems over trade. And he was absolutely right. If you look at people who say that free trade is not a good idea for the U.S. today, they'll say it uh, hurts labor, leads to higher unemployment. If you go back and read the trade debates of the 1820s, they'll say the problem with trade is it causes unemployment, it reduces wages and hurts workers. So we just hear the same complaints about trade time after time. It used to be the Democrats were the free trade party and Republicans were the protectionists. And now in the modern day, that's flipped. It's not necessarily a political or economic principle here. You're just trying to get reelected, and so it depends on what your constituents think and who you're getting your votes from. Even prior to 1950, a lot of the evidence we had on trade was basically theory-based. But what's happened is economics has moved into a much more empirical direction. And on the basis of empirical evidence, we can see and quantify the benefits to consumers and sometimes to producers of uh, having access to different markets. There are many book prizes. There are even many prizes for business books. But nowadays, the winners tend to be books that point out what's wrong with business and come up with government solutions. More antitrust, more privacy law, more economic redistribution. This prize highlights another truth, that markets come up with the best solutions to contemporary problems, and Hayek showed us that. And now I'd like to invite Amity Schles, author and chair of the Coolidge Foundation and chair of the Hayek Prize, to the stage to introduce our winner, Douglas Irwin. Good evening and welcome, Raihan. It's my honor to introduce the 15th annual Hayek Prize winner, Douglas Irwin, the John French Professor of Economics at Dartmouth. We welcome Professor Irwin and his wife, Dr. Marjorie Rose, 
We thank the Smith family, a number of whom are here. I'm going to read the names of some of the jury members who are present, just to thank them so you can see them. Uh, Marty Zupan, stand up a little. Jim Pearson. Larry Moan. Who's Brian Anderson. I think it's important that we thank Dean Ball, too, who is the soul and stage manager of this prize. We have two special guests um, who are teachers of Professor Irwin, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati and Professor Padma Desai. The teacher taught the teacher. We also like to recognize the Hayek Prize finalist who is present, I believe, Peter Wallison. <laughs> the first time uh, I saw Professor Irwin's name was in a January 15, 1993 article on page A6 of the Wall Street Journal. It was a rather alarmed article by Robert Keatley, you may remember that name. The topic was the new trade agreement, NAFTA. At the time, the United States unemployment rate was 7.3%. The hypothesis of some of the commentators in the article, that was the alarm, was that NAFTA might push unemployment yet higher, perhaps to 9%, as our jobs fled to Mexico. There was, however, one reassuring voice in the article, a professor from the University of Chicago Business School at that time, early 90s, uttering a rather simple axiom, self-evident as he spoke it about Mexico, labor is abundant, but capital is scarce. Mexico would buy our capital goods, and US unemployment might not go up after NAFTA. And we can see now from the current level of unemployment that Dr. Irwin was not wrong. I could go on, but you've heard many introducings tonight. I will say one last thing that has to do with both Dr. Irwin and Dr. Rose. To me, the most important thing to say about Professor Irwin is that he is that rarest of commentators, timely and timeless. And the work of both of you is timely and timeless, relevant, but also serious. So we have a kind of national amnesia about trade, clearly. And through clashing over commerce, you, Doug, remind us of what we know. You remind us of the record. I'd like to also add a word about your teaching. Many of us are seeking in this room to figure out ways to teach college kids or introduce college kids to material they might not otherwise be exposed to uh, in college. I'll put that politely too. Um, but we, most of us are stuck in words, charts, and lectures, and PowerPoints. And Professor Irwin and Professor Rose have come up with a course that, that, that is truly innovative. At Dartmouth in the fall, they lead students in the review of two countries, Chile and Argentina. And they asked, what have the economic policies in these countries wrought? How do they affect the economies of these countries? That's wonderful to study a natural experiment. But in addition, the professors take their seminar students to Chile and Argentina to see the results for themselves of differing economic policies. Everyone would want to take that class, which is why there are 60 students um, who apply for just a, a dozen spaces. Um, we can't think of a better way to teach young people. And now I'd like to invite uh, Supreme Teacher, the 15th Annual Hyatt Prize winner, Doug Irwin, to the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amity, for that very kind introduction.
And I'm glad you mentioned our class, because uh, we're preparing this summer to do it again in the fall. Um, we did Argentina and Chile because North Korea and South Korea were ruled out. Um, but you know, there are a lot of these experiments that one can explore. Um, but uh, we decide also to go to the Southern Hemisphere in December, which is Hanover's winter. Uh, and that was also very strategic um, in doing it that way. Uh, I'm really honored to receive this prize. I'm so grateful to the Manhattan Institute, uh, and uh, it's a great honor to deliver this Hayek lecture in association with the prize. I have a lot of people that I should be uh, thanking. Uh, my father introduced me to a lifetime of scholarship. He is here, and he's still doing scholarship, so I guess I have to keep going myself. Um, Jagdish Bhagwati and Padma Desai were my teachers many years ago here in New York at Columbia, and they've been intellectual inspirations for many, many decades. Um, my wife Marjorie helped me finish the book. Um, I guess that's putting it a little politely. Uh, she didn't offer, th offer threats or anything, but uh, one, it could have taken another decade or two uh, without her uh, uh, prompting. And I also have some uh, Dartmouth students who are here uh, who actually helped me with the research and the reading of the book. Uh, Taylor Ng, are you here, Taylor? And um, Conrad von Molke, uh, who I did uh, see earlier. So uh, thank you very much for your contributions to this book as well. So I've been told that not everyone's had a chance to finish the book yet. Um, and it is 700 pages, but I will tell you that the 700 page version is actually the abridged version. Uh, because when I initially sent it in, uh, they sent it back saying it's too long. So I cut it back from maybe oh, 0900 to 700. So at some point, maybe you'll see the whole full version, but it, that is the abridged version that's out there. Um, so what was I trying to do in, in writing this book? Uh, what I want to do is provide a comprehensive history of US trade policy, which had not been done for many, many decades. And uh, which raises the question, what is trade policy? Uh, for us economists, we're sort of uh, dealing with this every day. Uh, it's in the news, of course, if you haven't heard. Um, but uh, trade policy, take each of those two words just for a moment. Trade, what is trade? Trade is the exchange of goods and services between one country and others. And it's always a two-way street. There's exports that are being exchanged for imports. And then policy, what is policy? Well, that's the government intervening in markets, usually to either encourage an activity or to tax and restrict an activity. So uh, that means subsidize the activities or to tax activities. Well, if we think about that trade policy, that means we have exports and imports and we have taxes and subsidies. So trade policy has four dimensions. Now, fortunately for the book, I only had to deal with one of those. And that's because the other three have very little relevance for US history. So import subsidies, that would be one category. No country subsidizes imports. Um, that would hurt domestic producers, cost taxpayers. It just doesn't happen. Uh, export subsidies, that sometimes does happen. Uh, the US has export subsidies. We have the Export-Import Bank. Occasionally, we subsidize agricultural exports. But in general, when you're looking at over 200 years of US history, export subsidies have not been a predominant policy instrument uh, on the part of the US government. Export taxes. Some countries tax exports for various reasons. The US does not tax its exports. Why? Because it's in the Constitution. There's actually a clause in the Constitution that Congress shall pass no law taxing exports for political economy reasons that we can get into. That leaves import tariffs, taxes on imports. And that is the predominant thrust of US trade policy from the very beginning. Uh, and that is what um, uh, the Constitution gives Congress the authority to levy. And interestingly, one, one of the things that I learned in, in doing the book is just how much our Constitution depended on trade policy. That is, there was utter failure under the Articles of Confederation to achieve a unified national trade policy. The national government had, did, not have, did not have the power to tax. And so the first thing the founders wanted to do was to give Congress the power to tax, to fund its operations, pay the national debt, uh, and ensure our defense. So trade policy is really part of the US very much from the beginning in terms of our laws. And of course, our Declaration of Independence in some sense has been related to our trade problems with Britain uh, during that time. So stepping way back, if import tariffs are the main point of US trade policy, what, what objectives are governments trying to achieve in setting those tariffs at either high levels or at very low levels? Well, there are three main objectives, and I call them the three R's because of the nice alliteration, of course, that Jagdish and so many others taught me, the three R's, revenue, restriction, and reciprocity. Now, I'll ask you to repeat that at some point, but uh, that's, the, that's the mainly all trade policy collapses into those three things. Revenue, why? Well, revenue taxes on imports raise revenue. That was essential for the federal government operating in 1789, which had empty coffers, debts to be paid, um, and operations to be funded. Restriction. 
You could also set those tariffs very high, not to raise revenue so much for the government, but to restrict imports, to protect domestic producers from foreign competition. And that has been a big thrust of U.S. trade policy throughout its history as well. And reciprocity. Negotiating with other countries to reduce their tariffs in exchange for reducing your own tariff as well through trade agreements. And throughout U.S. history, all those three R's, those three R's, have been features of what uh, U.S. trade policy has been. Um, but so what determines then the setting of those tariffs? Um, those three considerations, obviously, but uh, as the, the video suggested, it's always been political because it's in the hands of Congress and politicians have to set those things. And they recognize the founding fathers right from the beginning that's going to be political and it's going to be different interests that are going to be tussling over what those tariffs should be. So that's why James Madison in Federalist 10 wrote the following. A landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a mercantile interest, a moneyed interest, and many lesser interests grow up of necessity in civilized nations and divide them into different classes actuated by different sentiments and views. The regulation of these various and interfering interests form the principal task of modern legislation and involve the spirit of party and faction in the necessary and ordinary operations of the government. And then he immediately turned to a trade policy example, which we as a people have been grappling with for over 230 years. This is what Madison said. Shall domestic manufacturers be encouraged and in what degree by restrictions on foreign manufacturers? Are questions which would be di differently decided by the landed interest uh, and the manufacturing classes and probably by neither with a sole regard to justice and the public good? And rather pessimistically he concluded that it is in vain to say that the, the enlightened statesman will be able to adjust these clashing interests and render them all subservient to the public good. In fact, it was that word, clashing interests, that formed the title of this book because that is what the history of U.S. trade policy is, the clash of different interests fighting over whether the tariff should be higher or lower, whether whose jobs are going to be protected, which jobs are going to be destroyed, who's going to be earning income, and who is not. And that's a political uh, problem, obviously. So how does this play out? How has it played out over the past 230 years in the U.S.? Well, very uh, fortunately for me, um, those three R's, there's been three periods in U.S. history when one of those three R's has been predominant in terms of the objective achieved by Congress and the executive. And in addition, when you look at voting in Congress, it's very sectional. The patterns are long-lasting, and we see them even today, even though they may have been set back in the early 1800s. And the basic division is this, and here's, I'm, I'm giving away most of the book right here, um, <laughs> that the North has always been, or largely been, protectionist in nature because that's where the manufacturing belt grew up after the War of 1812 with textiles in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, iron in Pennsylvania, and then machinery in Ohio and the Midwest. And they've always faced import competition, and there may be exporters among them, but uh, a lot of interest in uh, keeping out imports. The South, that was the export platform, the export base of the U.S. starting in the 1790s, exporting cotton, tobacco, indigo, and other goods, and then later on the Midwest with other agricultural crops. So this north-south divide has been one that has been present in the U.S. from really right in the beginning. And to understand how U.S. trade policies evolve, you just have to understand which region of the country is politically dominant. And they act through political parties, but the political parties in some sense are a sideshow to the regional interests that are much deeper and transcend party. So the three periods of U.S. trade policy history have been this. Before the Civil War, the primary objective in setting tariffs was revenue. And that is because the politically dominant region of the country was the South, and the party through which they actuated that view was the Democratic Party. The Civil War reoriented and redistributed political party power in the United States, away from the South towards the North towards the Republican Party, the Whigs uh, first, and then the Republican Party, and the North, being the home of the manufacturing industries, wanted higher tariffs. So that is why after the Civil War, right up until the Great Depression, we see much higher tariffs on average. It was the North that was in charge of setting tariff policy. Then we had the Great Depression, which led to another political realignment in the United States, redistributed political power between the regions and the parties towards the South and the West and the, De and the Democrats, and that's when we got the transition from restriction to reciprocity. And it was under President Roosevelt that we introduced the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act, which enabled the president to undertake trade negotiations with other countries. 
And that is basically, up until 1993, uh, where we have been in terms of uh, reciprocity as being the primary goal of U.S. trade policy. Now, during much of the period after World War II, we were in a historically anomalous period in which there was a bipartisan consensus on trade in which both political parties and most regions of the country were on board with this idea of reducing our tariffs <clears throat> to open up markets in other countries through these trade agreements. And that is because it was the era of the Cold War. And foreign policy considerations sort of almost outstripped economic considerations in terms of setting those tariffs and the desire to achieve reciprocity. And what we've seen since the end of the Cold War is a reemergence of a uh, bipartisan non-consensus, if you will, bipartisan fight over trade policy. And the first indication of this was NAFTA in 1993, after the end of the Cold War, when we saw some fracturing on the Democratic side, certainly, but even some fracturing on the Republican side with Pat Buchanan. And I lived through the, the NAFTA campaign. Professor Bugatti and I uh, talked about it uh, many times. But it wasn't until years later, going over and seeing how um, fundamental that fight was. And that really was a demarcation in terms of uh, changes in U.S. trade policy. It was a very bitter fight. Um, but what's interesting there, too, is the regions of the country transcended party in terms of determining which side was going to win and how votes would uh, uh, come out in, ter in terms of Congress. So that's the sort of the era we're in, this bipartisan fracturing um, after the end of the Cold War in terms of uh, U.S. trade policy. So I finished this book in September of 2016. In fact, uh, we had a send party where we sent the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, files to uh, the publisher. And in September 7, 2016, most people thought Hillary Clinton would be elected president. Trade would not be on the agenda. No one would really care. The book would uh, gather dust in libraries, um, but I will have at least finished it. Um, instead, something quite different happened that made the book made perhaps topical, perhaps relevant um, uh, for today. Um, we're in a very unusual moment today for this reason, is that if you told me, looking back at the course of US history, that we would have a period of very low unemployment, an economy that's humming along, a trade deficit that's basically flat as a share of GDP, where manufacturing jobs are being created, where imports are not surging into the US, where no industry, except perhaps steel, uh, is demanding protection, no industries are really complaining about foreign competition. If you had told me under those circumstances that a president of the United States uh, would raise trade as the primary issue that's of national importance, um, let me put it this way, I would be very surprised. Because most presidents are very happy to le let sleeping dogs lie. And if trade is not a problem, you just don't deal with it. There are other national priorities. So elevating something that is not necessarily a national problem into a national priority. So now we are told uh, that um, the president calls himself tariff man. Um, we're told that trade wars are good and easy to win. Uh, and he's written that trade is bad. And he's insisted that foreigners pay the tariff, not American consumers. And the Treasury Secretary says a tariff is a tariff on imports, not a tax. Um, these things that we are told, um, let me just say, it's very unusual uh, given the history <laughs> that I've covered over uh, 230 years in the book. Um, and uh, we'll have some Q&A time uh, uh, in a moment, and we can get into these issues uh, in more detail. But I thought I would close um, with a quote um, from President Ronald Reagan. Uh, and this is from a radio address he delivered in November of 1988, uh, one of his last radio addresses. And uh, one thing Amity didn't mention is that um, uh, my wife Marjorie and I met when we were working in the Reagan administration at the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, this is right after the year we had been there, so we did not vet this speech, but uh, I think there are words worth heeding. And this is what President Reagan said in that address. Part of the difficulty in accepting the good news about trade is our words. We all too often talk about trade while using the vocabulary of war. In war, for one side to win, the other must lose. But commerce is not warfare. Trade, uh, trade is an economic alliance that benefits both countries, and trade helps strengthen the free world. Yet today, protectionism is being used by some American politicians as a cheap form of nationalism, a fig leaf for those unwilling to maintain America's military strength and who lack the resolve to stand up to the real enemies, countries that would use violence against us or our allies. Our peaceful trading partners are not our enemies. They are our allies. 
We should beware of the demagogues who are ready to declare a trade war against our friends, weakening our economy, our national security, and the entire free world, all while cynically waving the American flag. The expansion of the international economy is, is not a foreign invasion. It's an American triumph, one we worked hard to achieve, and, the central, and, and something central to our vision of a peaceful and prosperous world of freedom. So that was President Reagan in 1988. I think those words will stand the test of time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Irwin. Uh, we now have some time for questions, and I emphasize questions. Uh, Oh, microphone's coming. I'm about 150 pages in, and I'm embarrassed to say I'm from Boston, and I completely got the dynamics of the Boston Tea Party wrong. I was hoping you could just recount that briefly for people. Sure. So what's the common understanding of the Tea Party? Taxes got raised. The tea went overboard. British raised taxes on our tea. We were upset with that. So in Boston, I know I have some relatives here from the Boston area, a little upset about that. Go down to the Boston Harbor go onto an East India Company ship, take the tea, throw it into the harbor, teach the Brits uh, that they can't raise their taxes on us. Well, the reality is a, a little bit different. Um, the reality was that Britain actually reduced the tax on tea, which undercut smugglers in Boston who wanted to smuggle tea from uh, uh, other sources. Um, and so that it was the smugglers who were upset with the cheap tea coming in. Um, <laughs> because the British had the uh, audacity to reduce the, the uh, tax. So the story is a little bit different than um, you know, the British hiking the tax and increasing uh, the price of tea on us. A lot of little stories like that. That's why you should keep going. <laughs> Can I ask, if you, were, if you were the king and you looked at what China's... As Mel Brooks said, it's good to be the king. <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> But if you look at China's practices and the, the IP requirements for transfer and all the things that I think that they've done that's been unfair to their advantage, how would you respond? How would you deal with it? That's a, a great question, a very important question. Um, so in the press, I've been rather critical of the president's trade policies. I have uh, not been so critical of the approach on China, not because I agree with the tactics necessarily, but that I think there is a problem with China. Uh, and it's very different than the one that we were confronting in the 80s with Japan. Uh, China's obviously much larger, but it's also not an ally, not, and potentially a geostrategic rival to the US, and potentially a national security threat. Adam Smith, from whom we take uh, many of our doctrines, said defense is more important than opulence. And so that means in thinking about trade with China, there's an economic component, but there's a political component and a national security component. And uh, I must say that I maybe don't have full confidence in uh, the, the tactics and the strategy uh, being taken so far, but the fact that we have an issue, a problem, and China needs to be addressed, absolutely no question whatsoever. Professor Irwin, um, also on China, um, yep. I think it's uh, David Autor uh, uh, from MIT has uh, the famous work on the China shock and the effect of China joining the WTO and the imports coming into the US and how it's affected uh, manufacturing employment in the US and whatever the, the aggregate effects on, on US economy is, it's hurt relatively certain pockets um, of, of the US uh, labor force. What's your opinion on his work and his uh, thesis? I think it's very good and important work and what it's shown is that uh, imports of certain products, uh, particularly furniture and some apparel, uh, disproportionately hurt uh, certain areas, regions of the U.S. Uh, that were producing those products. Um, but I would note that that's history, that, that a lot of that happened in the uh, early 2000s, during a period uh, which the unemployment rate was declining in the U.S. Um, and our exports were rising, uh, and that, um, uh, that a lot of the, the growth uh, in uh, our imports from China were not due to changes in U.S. policy, but due to changes in China's policy in terms of reducing their tariffs on their own inputs, making them much more uh, competitive. So uh, that was also a period when we had, um, China had a huge current account surplus, reaching 10% of GDP. 
So it was a rather special period, I'd say. It was uh, historically anomalous, if you will. Um, and so I don't think that uh, we should think about that necessarily as the basis for U.S. and China trade moving forward. Um, China now has an aging population with a declining workforce. Uh, the China shock was a one-off event. Um, and uh, one can uh, raise issues uh, retrospectively about how we dealt with it at the time. But it is history. It's not something we're dealing with right now. We haven't been dealing with it for 10 or 15 years. Um, but it does remind us that, uh, that there are certain communities that can be hurt as a result of trade. And we have to think about what policies can best uh, um, alleviate that hurt without interfering with trade itself. Hi, it's my understanding that the way trade agreements have been negotiated has actually changed pretty fundamentally um, in terms of what we would ex accept for overseas regulation on products versus ours, et cetera. Is that true? And could you explain that change? And, and has that slowed down? My understanding is it's dramatically slowed down our ability to negotiate trade agreements around the world. It certainly made, first of all, the presumption is correct. Uh, when you go back and look at some of the early trade agreements, they dealt almost exclusively with tariffs. So tariffs coming after World War II were rel relatively high, uh, about 20% on average in most uh, what are current today OECD countries, and they've come down gradually over time. But once you sort of hit, you know, once you either start having free trade agreements where you get rid of the tariffs, or like with the Uruguay round, re reducing tariffs from say six to 4% or something like that, what you find is that the tariffs aren't the biggest barrier to trade. It can be regulatory barriers. And so the negotiations have moved into regulation. And that's very tricky and difficult because, first of all, there are many different regulations for different sectors of the economy, particularly in services, say. Um, and then you have to think about what sort of rules can you have uh, to ensure that you don't get regulatory protectionism. So when Europe, for example, would say that we're not accepting American beef because it doesn't adhere to our uh, uh, standards of health and safety, even though uh, the U.S. says these are internationally accepted standards. So a lot of it is standard setting um, in terms of health and safety. A lot of it can be uh, product design even in terms of um, whether you keep out foreign electronics because you change uh, types of switches or what have you. Um, so it's a very contentious, difficult uh, and uh, area of uh, negotiation, but that's uh, sort of where trade agreements have been going. In some sense, that's, uh, I mean, Professor Bhagwati is an expert on this, is one reason why the World Trade Organization, the WTO, has had difficulty reaching further trade agreements, is achieving that on a worldwide basis is very difficult. Whereas when you get some like-minded countries together, such as the US and the EU, or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a few countries in uh, the Pacific Rim area, that are interested in harmonizing some of these regulations and achieving greater trade and openness, um, it's much more feasible at that level. A specific question on the Chinese uh, uh, economy and Chinese policy making. Um, China, which grew at 10% per annum in the 1970s, 1980s, the GDP growth rate is now about 5.5% per annum. Uh, so it has um, massive amounts of products like aluminum, steel, which it cannot absorb domestically. So it wants to dump these items in the U.S. market. And the U.S. policy response is to impose uh, an import tariff on these up to 25%. So how is reciprocity possible here? Wouldn't you agree? Maybe. Yeah, so that, that, that raises an issue. Once again, the nice thing about studying the history is that uh, we've been through these things before. Um, so exactly, that was exactly the same issue that the U.S. had with uh, Western Europe in the early 1970s regarding steel. So one of the problems is that China subsidizes its steel and aluminum and other production. Um, and then the question is, how do we get rid of that? If you can't do it through negotiation, do you need some sort of stick to induce them to do so? The problem with unilateralism in that case is that if the U.S. raises the tariffs, then China will divert its steel to European markets, other markets, and then they'll be forced to do so as well. It would be much better to either work through the WTO, and there's a little bit of a myth out there that China has adhered. When Ch the WTO has ruled against China in the past, China has changed its policies. So it has worked. Um, that would be one route to go. Other route to go, instead of once again trying to do it unilaterally, where um, uh, China will, uh, you know, just not, will continue to subsidize, subsidize more even, is get a coalition um, of other countries that are, have been buying uh, uh, steel from them, Japan, 
uh, other allies in Europe and confronting them directly and saying we need to negotiate about uh, these subsidies. That's exactly what the U.S. did with uh, Western Europe and Japan in the early 1970s when excess capacity in steel was an, uh, an issue. Um, and, that, and we were able to work that out. So um, unilateralism may not be the most effective way to achieve that objective. But I think the broader point is that um, one reason why there's been this breach just recently between the U.S. and China is because when China, after uh, Deng Xiaoping, they were moving in a more market-oriented direction, under President Xi they've moved back to a much more statist, uh, uh, centrally directed uh, um, uh, way with um, a lot of industrial subsidies and input subsidies. And so I think that the breach between the U.S. and China is, is somewhat on the U.S. side. We've changed our view on China, but also a lot of it is China. And they've changed th their approach. Um, so I think what we'd hope for is some changes in the Chinese leadership in the coming decade to really help save this relationship uh, if it can be saved. I believe we have time for one final question. Professor, where do you see the United States is in terms of uh, the current macroeconomic cycle? Uh, as a follow on uh, to that, uh, where do you see the current administration's trade policies implication either on prolonging prosperity currently or exacerbating the pressure towards recession? into 2020? Sure, so uh, you know, we're at a very, uh, I use this word unusual quite a bit uh, tonight, I think, but we're in an unusual part of the business cycle in the sense that unemployment is historic lows, um, the economy seems to be humming along uh, quite nicely, um, and uh, that's why I've been a bit surprised that the president raised trade so much because um, it's created much more uncertainty um, uh, in global uh, equity markets, in uh, investment flows, um, it's created uncertainty in terms of with our trading partners, and that's something that you wouldn't want at this point in the cycle to uh, uh, disrupt things. So I wouldn't say there's a direct uh, causal link between uh, some of the trade policies and a recession per se, but it's um, created a lot of uncertainty in, the, in, uh, in where we are, and, uh, and I think some of the policies have actually been quite damaging to manufacturing industries and to uh, America's farmers who are finding that they're uh, getting locked out of foreign markets. And that has implications for the banking system in the Midwest. And so there are all these unintended consequences, a very Hayekian theme, unintended consequences of what you think you're trying to achieve some goal or, or um, help out some group of uh, industries or workers, and yet you're having adverse ramifications for other sectors of the economy. So I would look obviously much more at the Fed and other things in terms of whether we're going to head into a recession in financial markets, but the trade doesn't help. The trade policies haven't helped. I think keep this very long expansion going because there's no obvious immediate trigger to uh, push us into a recession. So that's why I'm surprised that instead of letting the sleeping dogs lie, um, the beast has been uh, uh, provoked. Please join me in thanking Professor Irwin. Thank